The 2024 Formula One season has begun and the first two races have been won by none other than Max Verstappen. But there were a few drivers in the midfield who impressed us with their performances and one of the names that comes to mind is Nico Hülkenberg. He put his car in Q3 in Bahrain and finished in points in Jeddah. It's true that he was helped a lot by his teammate in Jeddah, but we can't forget about the defense masterclass he showed against the much quicker Ferrari of Oli Behrman. And this isn't the first time the Hulk has displayed such remarkable feats in the Haas. Last season, he astoundingly steered one of the slowest cars on the grid into Q3 a record eight times. He finished ahead of his teammate in the standings after being away from the sport for three years. And it begs the question, how does he consistently achieve such results in a struggling midfield car? The answer lies in Hülkenberg's undeniable talent, trapped within the confines of an underperforming vehicle. I've often emphasized his untapped potential, and these recent performances only reinforce that belief. So let's delve into the trajectory of a driver once heralded as the next Michael Schumacher, yet found himself perpetually confined to the midfield, never ascending to the top teams. Born and raised in Germany, Hülkenberg grew up in a family with a business background. His father owns a shipping company. He picked up karting at a local kart track and just immediately fell in love with it. From the first lap, you know, I did in that kart, um, you know, I had the sparks in my eyes and fell in love with, with, with racing, with motorsport. He won numerous karting titles both in Germany and Europe. After karting, Nico jumped to Formula BMW in 2005 and won the title in a really dominating fashion against rivals like Sebastian Buemi and Sergio Perez. In 2006, he took part in the A1 GP series and once again dominated the series in his rookie season with nine wins, single-handedly securing the championship for the German team. He also took part in the German Formula 3 championship and finished in a respectable fifth with one win and six podiums. In 2007, he switched to the Formula 3 Euro series and emerged as a championship contender. However, he ultimately finished third that year. His teammate, Romain Grosjean, secured the championship title, while Sebastian Buemi claimed second place. He also tested for the Williams F1 team in 2007 at Jerez in Spain, and impressed by his performance, Williams immediately signed him as their test and reserve driver. Nico stayed in Formula 3 for 2008, and won the championship this time with a very comfortable margin. In 2009, he competed in the GP2 series, dominated the field, and secured the title with two races remaining in his rookie year. At that time, he became the third driver to win a GP2 title in their rookie season. The previous drivers to achieve this were Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg. Additionally, he became the second driver to win the F3 and GP2 titles in successive years after Lewis Hamilton. His success in junior categories was so evident that it would have been a shocker if he didn't get an F1 seat. And for 2010, he was announced to race for Williams F1 team alongside a more experienced Rubens Barrichello. The first race in Bahrain was interesting. He qualified 13th, two spots behind his teammate. In the race, an early spin caused him to drop down the field, and he finished 14th. The second round wasn't great either. Contact with the crashed Sauber ruined his race. However, it was in the third round in Malaysia where things would change for Nico. He made it into Q3 and outqualified his teammate with an impressive fifth place on the grid. In the race, he finished 10th and scored his first points in F1. He then continued his momentum and scored points at Silverstone, Hungary, Italy, Singapore, and Korea. In Brazil, he secured pole position in a rain-affected qualifying session, posting a time over a second quicker than Vettel, and finished the race in eighth place. Despite being in his rookie season, Nico had a commendable performance, finishing 14th in the championship with 22 points. His teammate finished 10th with 47 points. And even with such good performances and progress, Hülkenberg's contract was not renewed by Williams for 2011, and he was replaced by the 2010 GP2 champion, Pastor Maldonado. In 2011, Nico failed to secure a full-time race seat and was signed as the reserve driver for Force India. In 2012, Force India announced Nico as their driver alongside Paul Deresta. Uh, his first points for the team came in Malaysia, where he finished 9th. His best finish of the season occurred at Spa, where he secured 4th place. In Brazil, Hülkenberg came tantalizingly close to securing a race victory and a confirmed podium position but contact with Hamilton resulted in him receiving a drive-through penalty, which was extremely unfortunate. Sadly, that would be the closest Hülkenberg would ever come to a race victory. He finished the season in 11th place, ahead of his teammate who finished 14th. He outqualified Paul 12 times and ended the season 17 points ahead. So it seemed like Hülkenberg and Force India would go long, but that didn't happen. He signed with Sauber for 2013 after seeing them score four podiums in 2012. Even Nico regretted this decision later. In 2013, Sauber wasn't as competitive as the previous year. 
His best result was in Korea where he finished fourth and defended superbly from fast charging Hamilton and Alonso. He also qualified third for the Italian GP, which was pretty impressive. He finished the season with 10th in the standings. It wasn't necessarily a bad season for Nico, but definitely not what he had hoped for in terms of performance from the Sauber, which is why for 2014, he moved back to Force India. This time, his teammate at Force India was Sergio Perez. He consistently scored strong points and finished 9th in the standings with 96 points, ahead of his teammate in 10th with 59 points. What Perez did manage to get, though, was a podium in Bahrain. In 2015, he continued to drive for Force India. However, this year proved challenging for Nico as he suffered from five DNFs and struggled to score points regularly due to issues with the difficult car. He encountered numerous technical issues and was involved in crashes. Consequently, he finished in 10th place behind his teammate Perez, who finished 9th. In Russia, he missed another opportunity to score a podium, while Perez capitalized on Nico's misfortune. He remained with Force India for the 2016 season, yet it proved to be another series of unfortunate races for Nico. Despite qualifying 5th in Monaco, he was jumped by Checo during the race and missed on a podium. Additionally, he endured 4 DNFs. While Checo finished 7th in the standings with 2 podiums, Nico finished in 9th place. Nico's chances at podium finishes were repeatedly dashed by unfortunate events, which is quite baffling. At the end of 2016, Nico signed a multi-year contract with Renault. At Renault in 2017, he was joined by Jolyon Palmer as his teammate for the first half of the season and Carlos Sainz during the second half. Now, since Nico was finally in a factory team, hopes were high. But boy, did Renault struggle that year. Nico experienced six DNFs with the highest finishing position of sixth. In Singapore, Nico benefited from an incident at the front and was running in third place, poised to secure his maiden podium. However, a little later, Danny Kvyat brought out the safety car and Renault then made a strategic error, causing Nico to drop to fourth. To make matters worse, an oil leak issue forced him to retire. My God, that was painful to witness. How does this happen every time Nico is on the verge of scoring a podium? It's one of the greatest mysteries in the world, and I'm not exaggerating. And while his previous teammate Checo finished 7th in the standings with 100 points at Force India, Nico finished 10th with just 43 points. 2018 was an interesting year. He finished 7th at the end of the season and was essentially the leader of the midfield pack. It's hard to explain 2018. Although he finished at the top of the midfield, it was actually a tough year for midfielders overall. He scored 69 points and was over 100 points behind Daniel Ricciardo in 6th. Despite a few strong performances, Hulkenberg's season went something like this. Nico Hulkenberg has come a cropper and he is out of this race. He's collided with Nico Hulkenberg. Nico Hulkenberg going straight into the rear. Nico Hulkenberg retires from the race. And that is Nico Hulkenberg against the barrier. Boxing retire. Oh, Those Renault engines that year had more issues than Vogue. And it wasn't a surprise when Red Bull dropped them as their engine supplier. In 2019, Daniel Ricciardo joined Renault as Nico's teammate. And it was the same story this year, the car was terrible. On top of that, he was outqualified by his teammate who finished 9th in the standings while Nico finished 14th. Yikes. But the standings don't tell the whole truth. Renault, again, had questionable reliability to say the least. They suffered many DNFs due to that. There were numerous instances where Nico encountered issues while in strong point scoring positions. That season was utterly disastrous. And while everybody was hoping for this pain to end, it did, but not the way anybody had hoped. At the Belgian Grand Prix, it was announced that Hulkenberg would be replaced by Esteban Ocon for the 2020 season. Now, I would like you to take a moment of silence for that decision by Renault. Nico did not have a contract for 2020. He drove in a few races for Racing Point when the main drivers tested positive for COVID and continued being reserve and development driver when the team was rebranded as Aston Martin in 2021. He was also in consideration for the Red Bull seat in 2021, but the performances from Perez in 2020 with the impressive win in Bahrain made Red Bull sign Perez instead. Also, during his years away from F1, Nico tested for Indy cars, but in the end decided not to follow that direction. Nico continued his reserve and development driver duties for Aston Martin until 2023, when Haas signed him to drive alongside Kevin Magnussen. And in 2023, we witnessed some truly impressive drives from Hülkenberg, it was unfortunate that Haas finished last in the standings. Their car suffered from high tire wear during races, meaning that even with Nico starting higher on the grid, it wasn't enough to keep the car in contention for points. Nevertheless, he made it evident that he was the lead driver in the team. He outqualified his teammate most of the season, but it's a little hard to judge when the car is bad. 
his performance has got him the contract extension to 2024. But when you really think about it, is Haas really the team where Nico belongs? Honestly, I don't think so. How the big teams missed on Nico early in his F1 career is beyond my understanding. He was right up there with the likes of Rosberg and Vettel in terms of performance in the beginning. And while these drivers got promoted to top teams, Hulk just couldn't break out of the midfield. Now coming to the real question, what does the future hold for Nico? Not many people realize this, but Nico is actually the third oldest driver on the grid right now behind Alonso and Lewis. He is currently 36, and I honestly don't think he'll go as long as Alonso. In my opinion, he has two to three more years left in Formula One. He has been linked with Sauber, but I don't see it as much of an improvement from Haas, at least in the coming couple of years. There is a good chance that Haas would be keen on putting Oli Behrman in the car for 2025 and would like to keep Nico as his teammate. Aston Martin could be a really good option for Nico if Alonso decides to switch teams in 2025. There are a lot of options for 2025, but the thing is Nico is at that age where not many big teams show much interest in drivers like him when there's a long list of young talent waiting in line. But it's F1, so anything can happen. Maybe his performances in 2024 change his fortunes. In the end, I would like to say that Nico was a pretty solid driver when he joined the sport and kind of still is, but his timing and luck with a few self-made mistakes along the way just dragged him down from reaching the success we all knew he was capable of achieving. There's still hope for him to achieve greatness, but the chances are much slimmer now. On that note, it's time to end the video, guys. If you enjoyed it, give it a like and don't forget to subscribe. If you'd like to support this channel, we have the memberships now, so join it if you're interested. Also comment down below where you think Nico could go in 2025 and I'll see you guys in the next video.